This is the Math Map Book Club, where ordinary parents encourage one another to develop an extraordinary appreciation of math. We love what we know and struggle over the unfamiliar. Through weekly conversation and exploration among friends, we can begin to enjoy ideas that seem difficult. Join our book club as we discover how math helps us to know God and to make him known. Hi, I'm Lee Bortons, and it's Monday, January 30th, 2023. Welcome to the Math Map Book Club, where Kirsty Gilpin and I discuss a math concept each week from our soon-to-be-released math curriculum for families with students in classical conversations, communities. Kirsty and I spent a lot of years um, talking about the difficulties of math education, and we found there are many reasons it's difficult, but they can all be identified and overcome. So I love math because it helps me to hear more of scripture. Today, Kirsty read a verse to me that um, we're gonna end the book club with that demonstrates how the language of math is used even to describe our souls. Kirsty, why do you like mathematics? Oh, there's so many reasons. I think um, I was talking with my, with the master students tonight and I just the, um, I, I use the idea of a scratch on our glasses that if we're looking for God and we don't include math, we're not seeing the whole picture that he gave us math to help us see him. And, um, and it's a, it's a usually a unique perspective that we can't get anywhere else. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons why I, I really love math and love the math map is because um, it's helping us to seek after him and see all of him because um, we're looking through all of the different lenses. Good. Good. So this book club's a little different because we're studying a lesson a week from a math text instead of like a novel or something over 30 weeks in 2023. And we'll be taking the summer off. The book club schedule is designed for parents who want to prepare to teach their children ahead of time. So we're discussing the first semester through spring and the second semester next fall. To access the math map, you need to be a member of Classical Conversations uh, CC Connected Community. Please feel free to participate in the discussion, even if you're not in CC, as we will share on the screen the things we're going to discuss as we talk about math. So each week we consider a quotation or a reflection, something from the cover that's part of the exordium for the math map lessons. And tonight we're discussing lesson four, addition and subtraction. Kirsty, what are we gonna talk about in the cover tonight? Uh, <clears throat> I really love this uh, quote from Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. And he said that if in anything at all, perfection is finally attained, not when there is no longer anything to add, but when there is no longer anything left to take away. <clears throat> and I think one of the reasons why I love it so much is it, it hints at that fact that when we're saved, we're fully equipped, that we get all the gifts of the spirit and we're fully equipped um, to do the work that he has prepared for us. Um, that we're not waiting, right? That he doesn't say, um, oh, maybe if you're good enough, you'll get this gift, or oh, if you work hard enough, you'll you'll suddenly be equipped. But he gives us all that we need at that moment of salvation. Um, and then our sanctification is is getting rid of the fleshly part. Um, so I just love that reminder of his full equipping and gifting. Yeah, that's he's chiseling away at it um, for us. Yeah, I particularly like the cover uh, because of the artwork. So I don't know if Kirsty, you want to share what you were sharing with Donna? Tell them about the artwork at the top. Sure. Um, so I know you can't see it here, but on uh, the last, maybe if you want to go back a slide, Julie, and then they can see the, the full artwork. Um, so it's a picture of, um, of a frog leaping from lily pad to lily pad. And we were working really hard to come up with pieces of art um, that were um, going to be helpful as an exordium, as a hospitable entry into the math topics each week. Um, and when it came to addition and subtraction, we we found some pieces that we liked, but weren't sure about. Um, and we were trying to capture that idea of, of hops on the number line, right? The number line and the points on the number line. Um, Lee really likes frogs. And um, her granddaughter, uh, her, it's, her name is Lily. And so um, I asked my daughter, I said, well, can you, can you create some art for us of a uh, frog hopping from lily pad to lily pad? And so um, she created this for us and, and there it is on the cover. So uh, lots of meaning in that one picture. 
but also lots of things to to discuss um, and accessible to your younger students and your older students to talk about number lines and moving on the number line through addition and subtraction. Yeah, and I just really um, thank Kate for drawing it because one that's the privilege of actually designing the curriculum is we get to choose the artist. But the other thing is it just added to our um, wide selection of images because this is probably the only one that we have drawn by a child. And she also used a computer to help to draw it. And so each of the art pieces, if you went through them, you would see that they're different mediums. And so I just appreciate what she did here. And I, I love frogs. Um, I don't know why I love frogs so much, but I just do. You I know house, why. You, know? you have oh. a symphony of frogs outside your house. Every, yes, you have yeah. lots of frogs by your house. I do have lots of frogs. <laughs> So I also wanted to share um, something that Kirstie didn't know I was going to talk about, but I had kind of a discouraging day today, and um, and and that's okay. You know, there's good days and there's bad days. Um, but I was getting ready about a you know, half hour ago, just rereading the uh, cover and looking through the booklet for week four. And I want to tell you, when I read John Wesley's uh, prayer, I mean, it was just it just changed my whole attitude. Just this whole phrase on here, which I know you were going to talk about, but I want to read this part. He says, I am no longer my own, but thine. I was really trying to be my own today. And so, Kirsty, thank you for finding this, you know, this uh, prayer. And Sherry's on here, too. And just to think that our math curriculum is what made me just change, love the Lord all over again and you know, change my attitude. So I just really appreciated that and wanted to share that with all of you. So meanwhile, was always perfect. What? His timing is always perfect. He knew exactly what you needed. Yeah, he always does. Yeah. <laughs> I just don't, I'm just so impatient though. All right. So um, we oh, two things for tonight. Uh, if you want to chat in anything about the reflection that uh, from Antoine de Saint Exupery here, am I right? Isn't he the guy that wrote The Little Prince? Yes. Yeah, so that might jog where um, your memory of where that came from. So if you have any comments, that's great. We'll share them later. And then I had sent out a reflection on um, how do you teach your children about double negatives on our math math post this week. So I wanted to remind you of that because what we'd like to do this time is open up with more of you and uh, less of us as we get along with the book club and we're all getting familiar with it. We thought it would be good to give us more time to talk rather than Kirstie and I saying so much. So in order to give you a moment to reflect on the, um, the answer, how did you teach your children about double negatives? I'm still gonna remind us of the two things that we're trying to talk about the most during this uh, spring season. And that's, we've identified two main reasons that math is unfamiliar. The first is that math is a foreign, though universal language with many definitions that can be confusing to the general public. So over time, we hope to clear up some of those. But mostly though, the people would, uh, most people would define math as orderly, yet they're unable to identify a stable canon of math. We call ours the math map. And each week, Kirsty brings forward a small section of the math map to talk about so that we can see the underlining structure kind of like latitude and longitude are to geometry. There truly is underlying foundations to mathematics. So while you think about how you taught your kids about double negatives, uh, make sure your screens are on if you don't mind, and then uh, feel free to chat at the bottom if you don't know where it is. If you're not on Zoom often, I always get confused where I am because there's so many of these things out there to use now. And our able producer, Julie Melendez, will help us with the discussion. So, does anybody want to share first how you taught double negatives before we have hey, while, they, while they think about that, can um can we just chat about the dimensions real quick? Oh, sure, do that first. So, um, well, I was just gonna um share um tonight again with the master students. It was interesting because we were talking about math being a language, um, and the question was asked, you know, was that the language God spoke in at creation? And I had a thought that I hadn't had before that um, perhaps God spoke in a, in a unified pre-Babel language, and maybe mathematics was one of the things that separated out at Babel um, as a language. And that's why we all have to work so hard to recover it, um, because it was not, it was separated out. I don't know. 
Yeah. There's no, there's no theological basis for that, but I just thought I'd share that thought because um, I just thought it was interesting as we were talking about that. Um, but back to the math map, we've talked a couple of weeks about the domains and how the domains sort of give us a sequence uh, for the curriculum um, as we, we can look at the same concepts and ideas uh, using different kinds of numbers to make things um, simpler or more difficult, um, which really stems from whether or not they're familiar or unfamiliar, um, that if we use familiar numbers, it can help us to um, grasp concepts that may feel um, more foreign. And then um, as we become familiar with the ideas and we could become familiar with the numbers, we use harder um, or less familiar numbers. The scope of the curriculum is really designed uh, or defined by the dimensions. And I think it's a great time just to share the story, um, trying to be brief here. When uh, Lee and I first started working on this, I had the conversation with Lee and I knew for years, CC had wanted to have its own math curriculum um, so that they could support people in mathematics uh, because Saxon is owned by a great big publishing company. You're not really allowed to do anything with it. And CC wanted to be able to provide support but they needed their own math curriculum. And I knew that this had been talked about for years. And when I finally sat down with Lee six, uh, almost exactly six years ago now, um, she said, I've been praying about this for years. And I finally feel like the Lord has given me what he wants me to do for math. And I just think that's really important. I want, I always want people to know that this was not, um, this was just not a happenstance kind of a thing, or we decided to have our own math curriculum, but Lee had really been praying over this for a long time and really felt that this was the direction that the Lord had given her, um, was to or the organization of mathematics by dimension. So I pulled out here the dimensions that we look at. Um, we've talked about 0D. Um, we're currently in the middle of 1D. Uh, and then there's 2D, 3D, 4D, and then ND represents sort of like any dimension, right? And that's where we really are looking at the patterns um, that, that build through these dimensions. Um, so as we go through the coming weeks, we'll look at each of these a little bit more in detail. Um, but I just wanted to share that story that this organizing principle wasn't CC's and it wasn't Lee's, but it was really that this is how the Lord has structured things and, and revealed that. Um, as the direction for the curriculum, and that's why it's why it's ordered uh, and structured this way. I love that. Okay, we've got some number line or not double negative conversation happening. Um, does anybody want to verbalize theirs, Jill? I always know you like to talk, Jill. I'll put you on the spot. Well, my comment said that at the time I did whatever was in the math book that I was using. And so we just did that. Uh, and sometimes well, and sometimes not well. Sometimes it was the math book's fault. And most of the time it was mine. <laughs> Occasionally some of my children. But since having some exposure to the math map, I remember having an aha moment with something that seems as simple as adding and subtracting and your negatives when I realized some things about vectors and I uh, I'm not teaching a class on vectors yet so my <laughs> my verbiage might be a little sketchy but I did understand that vectors either maintain or change uh, that the scalars and the directors the direct vectors these signs can either maintain or change what's happening and I thought, oh my goodness, that makes so much more sense. On a number line, what direction are you going? And then are you gonna maintain that direction or are you gonna change that direction? So if you're headed in a negative direction and you come across another negative, that has changed your direction. Um, so you're no longer maintaining a negative direction. And it sounded, it sounds complicated uh, if, or it could sound complicated if you'd never heard it before, but seeing it, acted out in the math map and seeing those things, I thought, wow, all I had to do was teach my child, are we maintaining or changing? That's really all I had to do mm. for addition and subtraction, whether we're adding two positives, two negatives, or one of each. And, and I thought, why nobody ever showed me that before. And so just looking at it with something they could relate to, am I moving forward or going back and being able to act that out with your four-year-old 
or um, talk about it in different dimensions with your older students. Um, that's what I would do differently. That's good. Lots of number line um, on here. So like the, Melba likes to start with visualizing the number line. So physically walks in the direction to the number, defining positive and negative directions. That's cool. We have, a, uh, and Melba is also a challenge B tutor. So how have you, how have you done that with your class, Melba? Your challenge B students. Do you have them walk the line? There's so much noise. Can you hear me? Oh, you're good. We can hear you just fine. Just fine. Um, so no, actually my mind goes to the double negation in logic. Um, so, you know, if it's, and so we're talking arguments, but it totally goes with numbers as well. I like So that. I'm going to, I'm going to meet myself. Like yes. Yes. Okay, good. That's good. That's good. So I love the integration of logic. Oh, all math is logic. Um, excellent. <laughs> Susan, you want to share what your visuals are? Sure. So, so I've struggled with with different visuals over the years. Things like um, borrowing money and earning money, and that never works quite well. Um, and things with temperature above and below freezing doesn't always work. But so, so more recently, this one seems to work for any age group. So. If you're, if you're moving toward the positive numbers, that's happiness. If you're moving toward the negative numbers, it's sadness, right? And you can even draw the little faces at the end of your number line. And then it works with any kind of, any combination of sign numbers, no matter where you start in the number line. Um, in the case of double negatives, you're taking away sadness, right? One of the negative signs is taking away. The other negative sign is your sadness. So most students can logic through. If I'm taking away sadness, that means I get happier. And so I'm moving to the right on the number line. Mm. And so then they can really work with any combination. So, so far, so far, I haven't found um, a, a situation where it doesn't work. So, so I've been like using it for a couple of So when you're, when you're talking about temperature and you're getting colder, you're taking away heat. Like you could probably find a lot of things that have a negative and positive uh, or antonym to each other and then negative and positive. So is that what you mean by you, you always find ways to use it? Right. But I think with the temperature thing, students, some, some of them don't understand that they're taking away heat and they're like, oh, I'm adding cold. And then it's like, no, no, no. And then we get into a whole science lesson. Whereas mm -hmm. happiness and sadness, everybody kind of gets it. <laughs> so, I love that. That's good. That's good. And then we have a, a literature integration here. Um, Le Totes also uses a double negative. Did I say that right? Jan, 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 Jana needs to explain it to yes, us. Yes, Jana, explain it to us. Well, I never know how to say that word. Okay, good. Lidities? I think it's, I think it's mm -hmm. Yeah, Lidities. Lidities. Mark always said like totes. <laughs> So anyway, that's why I typed it in the box instead of saying it out loud, because <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce it. But it's like when you would say something like, well, he's not bad looking. So not bad is the double negative. And what you're really implying is that, you know, he's, he's very nice looking. So um, kind of uses that to emphasize the okay. two negatives to emphasize the positive. Mm -hmm. That's good. All right, lots of good, good hints here. I think we've covered them all. Anyone else have something so they'd like to a, share? He's got a bigger one from someone. Oh, there it is, yes. Ashley. Ashley. Go for it. Um, so I have not taught my kids double negatives yet, <laughs> but in the past when teaching math, um, I found it helpful to kind of come at it from the perspective of talking about inverses. So every um, positive number has its inverse, which is the negative of that number. And it's the inverse because when added together, you get zero, which is the additive inverse. And so if you're talking about a negative number, what is its inverse? What can you add to it to get zero and it would be the positive version. So just kind of the idea that they're kind of 
coming in pairs and that for each number you have this opposite. Um, and I think it's nice with that idea of, of an inverse in mathematics because it can be kind of expanded to then multiplication and division. So um, I just think back to high school algebra when you divide by a fraction and you memorize like, well, keep change flip. Like you keep the first one and you change the sign and then you flip the fraction and just not liking the idea that you just memorize that uh, <laughs> procedure without understanding mm -hmm. what it means. So, um, so again, just when you're talking about a multiplicative inverse, something that you can multiply to, to something else and get one, um, that identity, um, I don't know if that's making sense, but it can like be expanded totally. to that then. Yes. So instead of dividing, we can multiply by the inverse of that number. Um, so I think it's, uh, that could be helpful again, to take away the idea of like, just memorize it or just, uh, I don't know, mm -hmm. just, uh, remember how to do it. It's like, Oh, look at the beauty that these both addition and subtraction and then multiplication and division can, um, like this concept can be in both of those worlds. So. Yeah, so that's a good segue into what Kirsty wants to talk about tonight, where how when you start working with double negatives, you actually are introducing the operation of multiplication. And so um, why don't you go ahead and explain that to us? And then one thing I just want you to know is um, uh, these kind of ideas that you're sharing with us, they're for you. They'll be in the compass. Don't like, so we're sharing how did we teach these things, but don't expect your youngest children to understand it. When you're teaching them something that's abstract like this, it's, it's the Lord's opportunity for you to really understand it, and then they'll eventually get it. So Kirsty has a really uh, interesting explanation of um, these double negatives that she wants to share with us. Is that okay, Kirsty? Good timing? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I was just going to say, Ashley, that's a, I, as Ashley talked about inverses, that that's a really good argument for um it, it's a really good argument for when uh, for us using language with our younger students right that um a lot of times historically right the idea of inverses has been sort of saved till high school right you just say well that was high school algebra um by then our kids have either like already gotten confused with how to deal with double negatives or memorized, tried to memorize the rules for double negatives. Um, but if we can bring some of this language down to our younger students, we can give them pegs so they can build that understanding. Um, so I wanted to start, um, it, as you see here, we've got one of our charts on the screen and I've pulled out two parts. Um, one shows the hops and the other one shows vectors. And so I thought we'd start um, maybe by by just talking about the hops and how to, to think how counting up and adding compare and then how to counting down and subtraction compare because that's really where we start with our kids, right? Is counting up or counting down. Um, you know, Lee's always saying, you know, when you're out with your kids and you're counting the stairs, right? Or, hey, um, we have 10 stairs, let's count down as we go down um, so that we're actually helping them. So I just wanted to have you think for a minute, um, right? That, that that connection there, right? That both of them are really moving by ones. Um, that when we do adding and, and subtracting, we're really looking at, um, you know, here, if you look at our hops, we're hopping one at a time, right? Um, in the um, positive direction, right? When we subtract, and then still talking about natural numbers, right? If I subtract a number, I'm going one at a time um, in the negative direction. So just starting there, right, with our kids to help them think of going up the number line or down the number line, right? We're going one at a time when we count up. And then we're doing multiple hops, right? When we're adding, we're going, I'm going three, I'm going three hops instead of just one, thinking of it as one at a time. Um, and so then my next question for you is, is it possible for that negative sign to have two meanings? Right. And so um, a lot of times we, we look at our number line and we think we have positive numbers and we have uh, negative numbers that one's kind of giving us that right and left. Um, although if our uh, number line is oriented differently, it might be up and down. Um, right. So, but one, they're both giving us a, a direction away from our origin. 
right? So we've talked about the importance of that origin. And if I'm moving in one direction, I'm going positive and the other direction is negative. Um, but then um, Jill alluded to this, the idea of um, reverse, right? And this is where, when we think of that negative sign as being a reverse, that that's really uh, where we're talk, starting to talk about multiplication. Um, because I'm, I'm now saying, okay, take what I have and reverse its direction. Um, and so that's why I have here both the hops, right? Um, and we've got vectors. And so um, with younger students, the hops are really helpful, right? Because we can hop and we can think of the frog, um, but it's a nice way then for older students to start thinking about vectors. Um, and I, I like to think of vectors as pirate numbers because they have um, a magnitude and a direction. And so I just think of pirate maps that usually tell you, you know, you have to walk four paces um, towards the tree and then you get to the tree and it says now walk three paces um, towards the jagged rock. And so you have to pick the right jagged rock and walk, right? And so those are vectors because they're telling us a direction and a distance, um, right? How far, magnitude and direction. So in 1D, because that's what we're still talking about in 1D, we really only have two directions, right? We can have the positive direction and we can have the negative direction. And so what we've got here um, on the screen are showing how when I represent things as vectors, right, I can go, I can start one, I can draw my first one and then it's my second one and that adds them. And here you can say I can take, um, I have a positive vector and I'm subtracting a vector and I go back the other direction. And now if we, right, we see that with just um, addition and subtraction of our vectors, but now we have this idea of, of direction and reversing. Um, so let's say that I had, um, I'm gonna just use my white space up here, right? So if I have a positive vector, but I said something about reversing it, I put that negative, well, what do I need to do? It's going to have the same magnitude, but going the other direction, right? Um, and so now if I have this vector and I want to subtract, right, a vector, well, I have to reverse the direction. And so now I would put that one there. I've reversed its direction. And this is true even if, um, I think there's a way I can erase. Yes, here's my eraser. So I'm going to erase this and find my drawing again. Um, so let's say I had a vector that was going in the negative direction and I said to reverse it. Well, now that vector is going to reverse and go in the positive direction, right? And so now if I had thinking back like down here where we have our um, addition, right? I want to have this vector, but I want to subtract a vector that was going the other way. Well, again, this is telling me to reverse it. And so now I can see that I'm actually going to be, right, putting these two together to get my resultant vector. So vectors just, to me, um, give us this opportunity of talking about reversing. And then all of a sudden, I don't have to remember those rules. I'm as Jill said, I'm either preserving, I'm keeping the direction I had, or I'm reversing it. And it's easiest to see here in um, 1D because I only have two directions. Um, when I'm, if I was to be doing this in other dimensions, it's a little bit trickier to to figure out how to reverse that um, direction of my vector. But here in 1D, it's really nice to see I'm either going right or I'm going left going positive or going negative. And that reverse just tells me to change um, to change that. So hopefully I didn't get too in-depthly with that. Uh, but it's, no. it's that idea, that reversing idea is, is really where we were kind of flirting with the multiplication a little bit. So I wanted to share with you why all your children are mathematicians in relationship to what Kirsty just said. So if you're playing football, the ball needs to be thrown forward. You can do a lateral, but it's gotta be always moving forward. So think about the way the ball moves as a way for your, where we see your children in two at vectors. So let's take a different sport. Let's think of soccer. 
So has everybody ever been like running, racing, racing with the ball and then they stop and they kick it backwards to the friend to pick it up rather than continuing forward or sideways? And then that child who knows, don't kick it to your friend, kick it to where your friend's running to. They're thinking in vectors. And it's a very natural thing to do. So we're introducing them um, right from the naturals, you know, the uh, digits and naturals from the very beginning as part of the notation that children will be learning. So if you get comfortable with vectors uh, with your little kids, when you get to Saxon physics, those first 50 chapters that seem so hard, there's a lot of vector math in there. And physics is really about the study of vectors in real life. And so we're trying to prepare them for uh, what may be coming after their CC um, years. So, well, oh, apparently it inspired a dance. Melba okay. attributed the song, the dance song, the cha-cha slide going reverse, reverse. So if you're going to a wedding soon, you will be dancing to that. And you can think of math. I'm going to one soon. I know you are. <laughs> oh. Our third son's getting married. Okay, so any other comments from you guys about teaching kids negatives and, and anything about vectors? If not, I have a bunch of other questions for you all. I have to get my notes up too. There How are we doing, Julie? No questions. Just one, one more general question about the history of math that we can tackle at the end if we have time. Okay, so um, I want you also to know, like. I, she may have, Kirsty may have used this phrase before and I just never listened, but we are going to tomorrow morning put pirate problems into the vector sets for the younger children. I don't have any now and now I'm going to put some in. So thank you for your pirate vectors. Mm -hmm. we do each other. I was wondering if you could talk about one more notation for a minute, Kirsty, uh, um, the summation symbol. I know you don't really have a white space here, but do you think you could tell us a little bit about it? Because besides the vectors, the summation symbol are probably the only two unusual things in our curriculum. Sure, um, I'm, I'm gonna grab some white space over here. Um, let me move, move all the people and then um, out of my way. I have, I have, I keep moving everybody around. All right, so I'm gonna use this. So a summation <clears throat> symbol, is is a sigma right and so it, it starts with an s and what that means is you're going to add up the things that come after it um so it's telling me if i had this something like one two and three right it's telling me add up one two and three um, and so the sum of those would be six Usually we don't write it that way. We usually make it look a lot more complicated because we say add up n from n equals one to three. And so we make it um, a lot more complicated looking because we're using all of this language and we're saying, so the first time through, n equals one and then you want to add to that the second time through when n equals two and then add to that when n equals three and so now when i add all of these up i end up with six and we can use it it's a handy thing because i can use it if i want to um, add up lots of things so if i said n equals one to uh, 1500 right it's a shortcut to writing out one plus two plus three and so on. Um, and then we'll see when we get to calculus that um, it, it also allows us to do where I can talk about, I'm gonna add up slices of something and I can go from N equals one to infinity, right? And so I can say now I wanna add up everything um, up to infinity. And it gives me a language to talk about that since I can't actually, uh, or a notation to talk about that since I can't actually add one plus two up to infinity. So I can have lots of different things that I'm adding up, but um, that's all that summation symbol means is add all these things up. And then the other pieces around it are shorthand ways of making the list. So how would you read what you just wrote there with the infinity symbol? If you were dictating that to someone or how would you say that? So let's say, let's pretend there was an N over two here for, for just, 
whatever reason. So I would say the sum of um, n over two or n divided by two from n equals one to infinity. So you sort of start with your symbol and then what I'm summing, where I started and then where I end. That's sort of the where I go in. Maybe next week in the uh, in the slides, I'll have to, to create a little white space where I can write. Yeah, it's a good idea. And then for those of you that are that haven't gotten to actually see the math map curriculum, this um, blue page that says has number four on the top that she's been writing on, that is actually what we call one of our charts. That's not the lesson set for the children. That's where the children would go if over 13 years of working with us, uh, they stuck, they were in the uh, math map. So basically we designed these charts as a summation so that as we wrote the curriculum, we knew where we were going. So I feel like as a Christian, that's partly what makes it a Christian curriculum is we didn't just say like, what do first graders know, sell that and we make some money and then what do second graders need to know. We actually wrote what an adult going into college mathematics would need to know and then worked our way backwards. And those charts are not available in the beta. Like if we only have access on CC Connected, we would not see this, right? Correct. Okay. Yeah, they're the secret sauce. <laughs> but you would give it all away, Lee. You would. I would. I would. But I know, you know you would. Yeah. Oh, somebody's got to. I think Curtis likes getting it. paid. So yeah, yeah. Need to do some there. Okay. Both so a little then back. we have a few minutes left. I, I want Kirsty to talk about that Bible verse, and then if we have time, we can talk about the history. Oh, and I'm supposed to do an ad. There are classical conversations, classical Christian community. You go to ccconnected.com if you want to find the math map. And you know, most of you on this probably already in CC and have access to it, uh, but there's a lot of parents that you know in your communities that probably haven't looked and aren't aware yet. So keep getting the word out about mm -hmm. it for me. Thank you. All right. So, um, so this was from um, our, our service yesterday that we were looking at 1 Corinthians um, from verse 18 on. And, um, and I was really struck by the whole passage, but especially um, in, in verse 28, um, Paul writes that God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. Um, and it, it really struck me um, as, as I was thinking about this of God using nothing, right, to reveal his glory and the things of the world becoming nothing, that when we look at addition and subtraction, we have a tendency to think, oh, well, that's what, that's what little kids do, right? Little kids have to learn how to add. And, and once they know how to add, then we'll teach them how to subtract. And, and we think of it as a, a, a junior skill almost. Um, we've been talking about flashcards through the math map and um, right, the idea of the addition flashcards and people are like, well, everybody knows how to do that. It's really easy to put that aside. And I thought about the fact that God, the things that we think, oh, well, I, I don't need that. God says, no, that's really important, right? It's just when we were in zero D, we were talking about how important zero D was um, that, that arithmetic and the skills of arithmetic for older students may seem um, almost like nothing, right? I don't want to spend time on arithmetic. I don't want to spend time computing. I don't want to st spend time just adding and subtracting. That's boring. I want to do something a lot more exciting. Um, but that verse just reminded me how important it is for us to, um, to stop and see what is it that God is asking us to pay attention today to today. Um, what small thing is God using today to teach us, right? That, um, it reminds me of Elijah, right? That he wanted to hear from God and he thought it was going to be in the loud wind and, and all of these, these big experiences. And then it was that, that still small voice, right? That God spoke to him through. And, and that just resonated with me, right? What little thing is he asking me to be attentive to today? And that's maybe where his greatest lesson is. And the things that I think are exciting and big, um, where I want to put my attention, he's going, no, that, that really doesn't matter. 
Um, and, and so that was just using that and then looking at this, how easy it is sometimes to overlook, right? Or here's confession time, right? The only time I failed, ever failed something in school was an algebra test in the eighth grade. And I got a 59 because I just decided that negative signs didn't matter. Um, I just, just didn't like them. And so I just ignored them, right? So that's something that's really small, um, but it matters. And that's what we were talking about tonight, right? That there's a difference between four minus two or a four minus negative two, right? That, that those signs that we're, we need to pay attention to them because they matter because that's so often where God is going to teach us um, through those small things and being attentive to the small things, um, which are, which are really the important things in his eyes. Um, and so just being careful. So just one more case where math is, math is constantly teaching me more um, about God. It also made me think about how in the wording, nothing, um, bring to nothing what the world thinks is important and how zero times everything is still zero. Yeah, just the math. Okay, so you said there was a question, um, Julie. To yeah, it was very, it was um, dealing with history. Uh, so Jen, a general question, if there's time for it, she said, Jen, do you wanna ask or would you like me to ask? Either way. You can, if she is still on. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Can you go ahead? I can go ahead. Yes, I can. Thanks. So it's what part, if any, does the history of how math was developed come into the math map? Do you believe it is helpful um, and or important to introduce how all of the numbers, ideas, formulas were developed as they learn the applications of the formulas and discoveries? So she had a favorite class in undergrad was the history of math. So naturally she's curious. Yes, so um, the short answer is no. The longer answer is it's there, but not as implicit as what you're describing. That would be a really fun um, seminar to have. And it might be something we could introduce with our challenge uh, three and four students. If you haven't been in three and four yet, you'll know that they spend a lot of time looking at math and I'm not math at time and discoveries throughout history that are science and math related. But the reason why I say the longer answer is yes, is because the whole idea of starting with nothing and working through all the dimensions comes from Euclid from thousands of years ago. And then of course, the idea of using the number zero in Hindu notation is only 400 or five, no, it's already, it's 500 years old. And so Kirsty and I have been very aware of the history of math, but we haven't like made it a history of math course. Yes, that's, that's awesome. It's kind of like how we do Latin too. We don't really have English, four years of English grammar, but guess what? You have six years of English grammar and CC because you do Latin for that long. So wow. it's it's hidden in there. That's good. Um, we do, Lee, on the, you know, one of the things we do suggest is uh, we have some um, suggestions of contributors um, that are related to what we're doing. So some people that you can go and look up. Um, we have some book lists for people who want to go in deep. And, and over time as the Compass, um, which is our online, um, it's more than a teacher's guide, more than a solutions guide. It'll be an online resource. Um, over time, um, we'll be able to incorporate some of those historical ideas in there. Um, but our first priority has been to um, introducing the main math concepts. Yeah, so let me show what you talk about because you guys don't get to see these pages. Across the top here, this is the week four book on addition subtraction, and it um, the contributor of the week is Euclid, and it gives resources and dates around Euclid. So if somebody wanted to go find out more, they could. That's good. Great. Um, the final one, Brittany, she's um, liking this to Ephesians four, um, which says to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life. And that is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. I love that. Well, that seems like a really good way to end. It does. Yeah. I love it. 
So thank you for Pirate Vectors and for the stories about double um, negatives and for just being encouraging to Kirsty and I as we continue with Sherry and the team to write the math map. And just thanks to all of you who are piloting and working on the naturals. This is a 20 year effort to change the culture. So thanks for being there in the beginning, you pioneers. <laughs> Night. Good night. <laughs>